right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to begin the. We are going to begin the next session while the staff is doing their terrific job of, of clearing tables. Thank you so much. We will uh, we will get started. Um, our speaker is Gary Lawson, who is uh, the Phil Beck Professor of Law at Boston University. He is the uh, very prolific author of uh, books and articles on law, um, published in professional journals, uh, used widely in teaching. <clears throat> Gary interned uh, earlier in his career for Justice Scalia, um, both at the, uh, the Appeals Court in Washington and then uh, at the Supreme Court. court. <clears throat> Uh, he is also one of the founders of the Federalist Society uh, and is, uh, remains on its board. Uh, in fact, that's how I first met Gary back when I think he was still in law school at Yale um, and invited, it was one of the first Federalist Society chapters. Um, they invited me to come talk about the Fairness Doctrine. Um, and um, Gary's been enormously active um, for uh, freedom, advocating freedom within the field of law. Um, and I just learned about another connection that uh, <clears throat> in his undergraduate uh, uh, philosophy major, he wrote his thesis on the objectivist epistemology. So we come, uh, he comes to us very well prepared. So please welcome Gary Lawson. Yeah, that, that didn't go over too well in college. Uh, that's a whole nother story. Thank you for coming. Th th this is the first time I've ever used PowerPoint, so you're guinea pigs. Uh, I teach my classes with Blackboard and chalk. When it comes to, yeah, when it comes to technology, I feel like Eddie Willers. I'm, I'm in awe of the people who produce and manage it, but uh, you don't want me running the locomotive. Um, all right, well, since this is going to be an adventure, uh, why don't we start the adventure with, who else, Nancy Pelosi uh, and Obamacare. Uh, one of the more memorable one-liners in recent times came out of the debates leading up to Obamacare, uh, but we have to pass the bills so that you can find out what is in it. Now, that's usually taken as an in-your-face affirmation of the practice of legislators passing laws, sometimes 2,000-page laws, that they and no one has ever read. And, and that, of course, happens all the time. Uh, that's not what Nancy Pelosi was talking about. Uh, that's taking her out of context. Uh, Nancy Pelosi thought it was perfectly clear what was in Obamacare. It's just that, according to her, we wouldn't really have a sober discussion of it until after the bill had passed. Now, put that way, her comment is not quite as interesting uh, as the out-of-context version, but it's actually more profoundly wrong. Uh, because the fact is that passing Obamacare, even four years later, would not tell you what is in it, if by the what you mean actual principles of law, good or bad principles of law. Because it turns out in those 2,000 pages of Obamacare, there's actually very little good or bad law. What there is a lot of is designations of lawmakers, people who in the future are going to make the law. And almost never are those people going to be members of Congress. Now, as I said, this is my first PowerPoint ever, and the, uh, the directors of the conference sent a memo to all the speakers saying, if you're going to use PowerPoint, the absolute one thing you never want to do is put text on PowerPoint. So I thought to myself, what if it's a really good text? What, what would Howard Rourke do? Boom. That's what Howard Rourke would do. So I want to start with one of the provisions from the intriguingly named Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Now, the context for the statement that you have up there, uh, without getting into all the mechanics of the statute, that's a different story, is that one of the central concepts is a qualified health plan. Right? Only qualified health plans can be sold on exchanges, and that's one of the principal ways of satisfying the government-required insurance mandate. So from its own perspective, from its own terms, this statute has to be able to tell a qualified health plan 
when it sees one. That's just one of the central ideas. So what does it say? It says the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall, by regulation, that means a thing that comes out of an agency process that looks, functions, operates in the law exactly like a statute, but which comes out of a bureaucrat rather than a Congress, shall by regulation establish criteria for the certification of health plans as qualified health plans. Well, that's really it? It's all up to the Secretary of Health and Human Services? Well, no. After all, the statute does say the term qualified health plan means a health plan that provides the essential health benefits package described in section 18022A. Ha, one might think, so the statute is going to define for us what count as the essential health benefits package described in section 18022A. Well, yeah, it does. Essential health benefits mean the health benefits defined by the secretary under subsection B. Really? Uh, yeah, really, the secretary shall define the essential health benefits. Now, to be sure, the statute does contain a long laundry list of things that are supposed to be included, and it contains an even longer laundry list of the things the secretary is supposed to be thinking about when doing this. But if you actually grind through all that stuff, the instruction really amounts to something like, you know, don't screw it up. Don't, do a good job. Uh, in particular, don't offend too many Democrat Party constituencies. Um, doesn't really say very much. So the bottom line of that is when 4 million plus people and a lot more on the way lost their health care, it, it wasn't so much because of Obamacare, it was because of the regulations promulgated under Obamacare. For Aristotelians, Obamacare may be the final cause, but it was the regulations of HHS that was the efficient cause. Well, okay, um, so you got one provision, one statute. Well, no, uh, it turns out that just within Obamacare alone, there are more than 40 provisions that don't actually create rules of law. Again, good rules of law, bad rules of law. That doesn't create rules of law at all. What they do is prescribe mechanisms by which rules of law will be created in the future by some other entity. That's just how the statute functions, and that, is just the tip of the currently burgeoning polar bear friendly Arctic ice mass underneath all of this. I could spend my entire time here just running through examples of things in the United States Code that have the appearance of statutes. They pretend to be statutes. They're officially treated as statutes, but they're really just collections of word sound and fury signifying nothing, some of them laugh out loud. I'm not going to do that. Now, there, there is a, uh, there's no outline in your binder, because what I came up, I'm an academic, so of course I came up with a 12-page thing with uh, citations to everything. Uh, if you actually have that in front of you, and if you don't, it's no big deal. Uh, there were a couple of examples that I picked out of the, uh, the many that, that could have been done. Let me just run through a few of them here. If you want to run a uh, radio or television station, you need a license from the Federal Communications Commission. The statute says the FCC is supposed to give out those licenses if public convenience, interest, or necessity will be served thereby. Uh, all those delightful CO2 regulations coming down the pike, those are pursuant to the Clean Air Act. What that says is that the administrator of the EPA should set air quality standards which, in the judgment of the administrator, are requisite to protect the public health. And one of my all-time favorite statutes, I mean, favorite in the sense that if I was a stand-up comic, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama would be my favorite presidents uh, because the material writes itself. Uh, the bank bailout bill of 2008, uh, officially the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, it says the Secretary of the Treasury may purchase troubled assets from any financial institution on such terms and conditions as are determined by the Secretary. What's a troubled asset? Well, a troubled asset is 
any financial instrument that the secretary determines the purchase of which is necessary to promote financial market stability. Now, the only difference between that last statute and hundreds of others that I could have picked out of the United States Code is about three quarters of a trillion dollars worth of budget. The fact of the matter is that delegation is, in the words of a Supreme Court justice from 80 years ago, running riot to the point where administrative lawmaking by far, by any relevant measure, dwarfs, I mean, overwhelmingly dwarfs, uh, the lawmaking that comes out of Congress. And this would be a whole nother talk. Administrative adjudication, where agencies take the place of courts, also dwarfs anything and everything that's coming out of the courts as well. Just a few numbers here. Uh, we're now over one million regulations on the books. The Code of Federal Regulations, which collects those, that's now up to 175,000 pages, spanning 238 volumes. So um, when you are voting for Congress, you're not actually voting for laws. What you're voting for is an institution that is going to select lawmakers. The actual lawmakers are going to be primarily executive agents. Sometimes the delegations go to courts, sometimes to private actors, occasionally even international bodies. The vast majority go to executive agents. And the majority of those executive agents answer to the president. So when you select a president, you're also, in essence, selecting the Congress and the courts as well. It's a big deal. So how did we come to this? There's got to be somebody who's getting something out of it. Because after all, in order to have one of these statutes that doesn't actually make law but makes lawmakers instead, Congress has to pass it, the president has to enforce it, the courts have to apply it, what's in it for them? Well, Congress we can start with. That's actually a fairly easy one. Um, there are a couple of reasons why Congress does this. Uh, one prominent one is, if you're a member of Congress, uh, it's a really good way of making yourself look good to really stupid constituents, right? After all, you pass this, I did something, a huge problem out there, see, we're out there. And then if something actually goes wrong, well, I didn't do that, I was the idiot bureaucrat over there, I certainly never what I intended. This happens all the time. Now, when you put it that way, trying to take credit and avoid blame by passing empty collections of words, that punt the decision off to someone else, it sounds pretty transparent. Are voters really that dim-wittedly stupid that they fall for this stuff? Yeah, I mean, the evidence from political science uh, is, is actually quite strong uh, that a good portion of them, of them are. Uh, not all of them, of course. There are some who know exactly what they are doing. Uh, what about the ones who know what they are doing and would really like for their legislators to be transferring wealth from other people into their pockets? How does, how does delegation facilitate that? Well, it does it in two ways. Uh, one is straightforwardly, uh, it reduces the costs of lawmaking. Uh, lawmaking is an expensive, messy business, at least if it's done in accordance with Article 1, Section 7, Clauses 2 and 3 of the United States Constitution. More on that later. Uh, on the other hand, if it can be punted down to an agency that can make a law simply by, and this is how rulemaking works, announcing what it's doing, waiting around a few months for people to file written comments, and then doing it, get a lot more lawmaking done, right? Uh, but even more fundamentally than that, the delegation phenomenon rests on something that's called unbundling. Congress is bundled. It's bundled in a couple of ways. First, there are 535 of them. If you actually want to get something, you have to somehow cobble together a majority of 535 of those people. Uh, secondly, uh, those people uh, are interested not just in what you as a particular interest group are uh, concerned about, but you have to compete for their time and attention with every other interest group on the planet. And finally, if you ever actually get one in your pocket, you not only get their position on your issue, but you also have to take their position on immigration policy, foreign policy, monetary affairs, and everything else. The thing about delegation to administrative agencies is some agencies have very, very broad jurisdictions. But even the agency with the broadest jurisdiction is 
concentrating on a particular area or segment. Agencies are less bundled than Congress. Right? So devolving the decision-making authority to an agency lets you, as an interest group, deal with someone who is concentrating on precisely the issues that are of concern to you, and not at all coincidentally, who when they're done serving on the administrative agency uh, may very well come to work for you, to put it as crudely as possible. If you're an interest group, which number would you prefer? 535, that's the members of Congress, or somewhere between one and seven, because that's the number of people at the head of any relevant administrative agency. It's a fairly easy choice. What about the president? Uh, well, that's an even easier one. Uh, as I said, sometimes delegations go outside the executive. Most of the time they don't. Who does that mean more power to? That means more power to the president. So the relevant number there is zero. That is, by my count, the number of bills that have been vetoed by American presidents on the ground that they unconstitutionally delegated too much power to American presidents. <laughs> well, but then again, there are the courts, right? Uh, if this stuff is unconstitutional, aren't the courts supposed to say something about it? Well, um, one might think that. Uh, it doesn't happen. Um, that number zero there. Uh, that represents the number of federal statutes found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court since 1936 on the grounds that they unconstitutionally delegated legislative power. Now, how did that come about? Well, that's a complicated story. It involves a lot of different issues. But the, the one thing you need to know, the different members of the Supreme Court have all sorts of different things in mind, all sorts of different goals they're trying to accomplish. The crucial fact is that getting the law right is fairly low down on the list for almost everyone. Right? Some of them are interested in greasing the wheels of the progressive state. Uh, if you've got an outline in front of you, there's a nice quotation there from a decision 25 years ago. This is the Terry Blackman writing for the majority. In our increasingly complex society, replete with ever-changing and more technical problems, Congress simply cannot do its job absent an ability to delegate power under broad general directives. That was the ground. Um, now, there are those who don't have that as their principal goal, but a good portion of the rest have as a primary value minimizing the role of the federal judiciary. And I include in this category my old boss, Justice Scalia, in the same case, says, while well, the doctrine of unconstitutional delegation is unquestionably a fundamental element of our constitutional system. Well, he was a professor. He urged its revival, actually. It is not an element readily enforceable by the courts. Right? Uh, the convergence of those various positions results in that number. And, and also another, my, of all the numbers I'm going to show you, this is actually my favorite. In the last 25 years, that's since 1989, that is the number of votes cast by individual members of the Supreme Court in cases upholding federal statutes against challenges that they unduly delegated legislative authority. And then that is the number of votes cast since 1989 by individual justices to invalidate statutes on non-delegation grounds. Uh, really? Um, yes, really. Well, all of that just goes to interests. As Rand instructs us, if you scratch an interest, you're almost certain to find an idea underneath it. Uh, and there is indeed uh, an idea, and indeed quite a potent idea underneath it. Why is it that people would get the idea to delegate legislative power from Congress to administrative agencies in the first place. And it would take a whole talk to give the full story there. Here's the 32nd version. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a movement developed that goes under the umbrella term progressivism. It's, it's not a terribly descriptive or, or useful term. But the basic idea was you had a bunch of people who decided they really didn't like Congress making decisions. They really didn't like courts making decisions either. They weren't actually too keen on presidents making decisions. Who they wanted to have make decisions was people like them, uh, really smart folks, or excuse me, really credentialed folks 
uh, with Ivy League degrees. And, and, and the reasoning went something like this. You, you want to build a bridge, what do you do? You get the smartest people from Harvard, Yale, and Columbia, you put them in a room and you say, how do we build the bridge? And they'll tell you how to build the bridge. Well, if you think people are not terribly different from rivets and concrete blocks and girders, uh, it's not a large leap to say, well, okay, you want to solve human problems, you get the people from Harvard, Yale, Columbia, you put them in a room, and you say, well, okay, we, you told us where to put the girders and the rivets, now tell us where to put the people. Uh, that notion of government by experts is what drove the development of administrative lawmaking, and there's, a, there's a, an important corollary to that as well. If you've got the really smart engineers in the room, um, what would be the role of law in overseeing them? Do you, do you want them to have to hold a lot of hearings before they act? Do you want them to have to run what they're doing through a bicameralism process? Do you then want judges second-guessing their decision? No, I mean, that'd be crazy, right? That's the whole point, is these are the smart people. Well, if you're viewing people like rivets and concrete blocks, well, wouldn't those? consequence be, well, you don't want the courts involved, you don't want procedures involved, you want to just turn the smart people loose, give them a budget and go. And it's exactly what has driven the development of American government for the last nearly a century. Maybe even, now it's 2014, I would even say more than a century. Who's this fellow? Well, most legal scholars could not tell you who this fellow is. They, some of them, if they're administrative law junkies, will recognize the name if I give it. But this is the Immanuel Kant of modern administrative government. This fellow's name is James Landis. Um, Landis was a professor. He was the dean of the Harvard Law School. He was on two of the early New Deal regulatory commissions, and more than any other single human being, is the intellectual architect behind the New Deal model of government. Not necessarily the substantive thing, but the model, the procedural form by which modern government operates, which is precisely passing these things that look like laws but aren't, but that designate other people to go out and make the laws. In 1936, Landis gave a series of lectures at Yale Law School that were collected into a book published the next year called The Administrative Process, by far the most influential, maybe the most important book in the history of American legal thought. And um, Landis had some very intriguing thoughts on how this particular vision of government could be reconciled with the United States Constitution, which, after all, sets up this procedure where, in order to make a law, you got to get these people to vote over here, and then you got these people to vote over here. you got to make sure they're voting on the same thing. If they both vote on the same thing. you got to send it to this person over there who gets to sign or veto it, and then you got a whole other separate. Then it's got to go to the courts, get to challenge it, and they have to decide whether it's... There's a whole lot of machinery involved, right? If you're really a progressive and you want the really smart people from Yale, Harvard, and Columbia to be telling everybody what to do, you, you got to get rid of all of that. Well, how do you get rid of all of that? Here's what Landa said about the relationship between, this is, this is a published book, this is not secret notes, this was out in the open speech at Yale Law School. Said, in terms of political theory, the administrative process springs from the inadequacy of a simple tripartite form of government to deal with modern problems. It represents a striving to adapt a government that still divides under three rubrics, legislative, executive, judicial, more on that in a moment, to modern needs. Okay, that sound familiar? Well, it's gonna get more so. The insistence upon the compartmentalization of power along triadic lines that's actually allocating power the way the Constitution says to. Oh, as you mean, he means, as he knows exactly what he's saying. Gave way in the 19th century to the exigencies of governance without too much political theory, but with a keen sense of the practicalities of the situation. Agencies were created whose functions embraced the three aspects of government. Rulemaking, enforcement, and the disposition of competing claims were all entrusted to them. So his bottom line is that the administrative process, quote, vests the necessary powers with the administrative authority it creates, not too greatly concerned with the extent to which such action does violence to the traditional tripartite theory of governmental organization. This is the 
critique of pure reason of the modern administrative state. Well, does that really mean that for people like Landis, they, they just don't want law involved? This is my favorite passage, again, in the same sense that the bank bailout bill is my favorite statute in all of Anglo-American law. It's really that good. This is Landis speaking. One of the ablest administrators that it was my good fortune to know, I believe, never read, at least more than casually, the statutes that he translated into reality. He assumed that they gave him power to deal with the broad problems of an industry, and upon that understanding, he sought his own solutions. So he didn't want the administrators to read the statutes. He just wanted them to do to act. Any of this sound remotely familiar? All right, so that's where delegation came from. I've already given you the 53 to 0 votes on the Supreme Court. Does that mean the non-delegation doctrine is dead? Well, 10 years ago or so, in an article, I called it the energizer bunny of constitutional law, because no matter how many times it gets kicked on, stomped on, stepped on, it somehow just keeps coming back. Because after all, for the Supreme Court to cast 53 votes, lower courts have to be doing something that they have to cast votes about. And in fact, during those 25 years, there is a slow, trickle, steady stream, though, of lower court decisions finding some way to declare various federal statutes unconstitutional on the grounds that they delegate too much legislative power. There was even one major one on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals last year. So the, the non-delegation doctrine has this feature where it, you kill it, and then it's back again. It's almost like it's a fixed point in space and time that you just can't get rid of at all. So um, why? There's something primal about the non-delegation doctrine, what makes it primal. And the, there are two dimensions to that, two questions that remain. Uh, one is, 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 I've been assuming that it's unconstitutional. I think everyone sort of takes that. Is it really unconstitutional? And second question, and it's logically distinct. Should anybody in this room care about the answer to the first question? Because after all, we're not talking about Judge Narragansett's constitution. We're talking about the actual thing, which is quite far removed uh, from an objectivist document. So. That second question turns out to be very, very complex. I don't think I'm going to have much to say about it in the talk here. Let me see, though, if I can say something in the time I have left about the first. Well, delegations would certainly be unconstitutional in the face of this provision. The legislative department shall never exercise the executive and judicial powers, or either of them. The executive shall never exercise the legislative and judicial powers, or either of them. The judicial shall never exercise the legislative and executive powers or either of them. To the end, it may be a government of laws and not of men. That would make it very clear who was supposed to do what. The problem, of course, is that's not in the United States Constitution. That comes from the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution. The United States Constitution contains no such provision. Uh, it doesn't contain a separation of powers provision at all. The words separation of powers never appear. Delegation never appears. Non-delegation never appears. None of this stuff ever appears. And it wasn't as though people in the late 18th century didn't know how to write that stuff. It wasn't just the Massachusetts Constitution. Any number of other states had similar provisions. So that particular observation has led some people, including, as it happens, um, former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, to doubt whether or not there is actually a constitutional ban on delegations. He said in 2001, the provisions in the Constitution do not purport to limit the authority of Congress to delegate or the executive to receive the delegation of power. Um, there are two things wrong with Justice Stevens' reasoning. Actually, it's one thing looked at from two different ways. But looking at it from each of the two different ways provides some intriguing perspective on the United States Constitution. That's really why I put all of this together. Uh, the first, with apologies to Johnny Lee, I call looking for law in all the wrong places. And the, um, 
the insight there is Justice Stevens is, like most people today, looking for a thou shalt not. He's looking for something in the Constitution that's, ah, oh, you can't do that. And if you're dealing with the actions of state and local governments, that's actually the right way to proceed. If you're looking at the actions of the national government, it's exactly the wrong way to proceed. The first basic question is what in the Constitution affirmatively authorizes the national government to do what it's doing, and even more basically than that. Here, here's, a, here's a way to, 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 to win some money at a cocktail party. Make a bet with someone about uh, which parts of the Constitution grant power to the national government. And it turns out the answer is none. There are no provisions in the US Constitution that grant power. There are provisions that grant power to particular institutions or actors of the national government, but nothing that grants power to the national government as an undifferentiated entity. So the first question of constitutional analysis where federal action is concerned is, can the particular institution that's trying to act find some authorization to it to do what it is trying to do? And since the basic authorizations are contained in the first three articles, the reference in Article I to the legislative powers granted elsewhere, those are vested in a Congress, President's basic power is the executive power. The court's basic power is, and only power, as it happens, is the judicial power. So the key is to figure out whether what anybody is doing when the Secretary of Health and Human Services is canceling people's health plans, is that the sort of thing that can fall within the power conferred on that particular institution, in that example, within the compass of the executive power? And to do that, just like the Obamacare has to be able to tell an essential health plan when it sees one, the United States Constitution has to be able to tell a legislative power, an executive power, and a judicial power when it sees one. And that turns out to be an extraordinarily difficult task. Again, in the outline, I've given some of the more colorful analyses over the years, um, one from 1825 uh, from Chief Justice John Marshall, the difference between the departments undoubtedly is that the legislature makes, the executive executes, and the judiciary construes the law. But the maker of the laws may commit something to the discretion of the other departments, and the precise boundary of the power is a subject of delicate and difficult inquiry. Uh, James Madison in The Federalist described it as something which proves the obscurity which reigns in these subjects and which puzzle the greatest adepts in political science. Uh, but elsewhere, Madison said, you can do it. There are things that are his language in their nature, legislative, executive, and judiciary. Uh, and a casual glance at the United States Constitution makes it clear that some sort of analysis of that sort is necessary. You have to do it. So if we're talking about actions by executive agents, administrative agencies like health and human services, the question is, what are they doing? Is, is what they're doing properly characterized as executing the laws? And in one formal sense, of course it is. Congress passes a law that says to the health and human service, go figure out what's an essential health plan. And if the secretary then says, okay, I'm figuring out, Aren't they doing exactly what the statute prescribes? What could be more executive than doing what the statute prescribes? And the question then becomes, is that what it means to exercise executive power, is simply to do whatever it is the legislature prescribes? Or is there something essential, something fundament, definitionally fundamental about it being executive power? And the example that I like to use here is suppose that instead of saying, go forth and do good, which is essentially what these statutes say. Congress instead enacts blank verse. You know, just Or um, in his confirmation hearings uh, a quarter century ago, Robert Bork described the Ninth Amendment as an ink blot. Well, suppose Congress actually enacts an ink blot. What winds up in the United States Code is an ink blot. And executive agent looks at that ink blot and says, aha, time to start nationalizing the steel industry. Okay, I mean, I, I'm just interpreting the ink blot. Well, no, they, 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 come on, there's a point at which the enterprise of interpretation stops being interpretation 
and it starts becoming lawmaking. It may be a very difficult line to draw, but it's a line that absolutely has to be there. Now, we could circumvent all of this if the Constitution specifically authorized Congress uh, to delegate its legislative power. Uh, but the provision that's up there, if you look at the top, uh, that's not from the United States Constitution. That's from the Numinal Constitution uh, that doesn't actually exist, right? Um, or does it? There is actually a clause in the Constitution uh, that says that Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for implementing or executing other federal powers. Does that include the power to delegate legislative power. Well, I've actually spent most of my professional life, probably half a dozen articles, a book, a whole lot more, uh, trying to explain why that's not right. The short answer to why it's not right is, turns out for a law to be proper, and this is not me making things up. This is actually extremely well supported uh, by 18th century sources. Uh, it's even become, at least in some applications, the settled law. Uh, my analysis here, and I don't say this as braggadocio, it's just a fact, has actually been adopted by a majority of the Supreme Court, at least in some of its applications, not all of them. Uh, and as for a law to be proper, it actually has to make sense in the context of the overall structure of the Constitution. And all the PowerPoint slides I put together, text or no, this is my all-time favorite, this is a list of provisions of the United States Constitution that deal with the methods for selection and the operation of the Congress. Not the powers that Congress exercises. I ex excluded all of those. This is just the procedural one, the things that set it up. So, yeah, this is how many provisions set up the Congress. Well, of course, it can then just punt all of its authority to executive agents. No, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So the real question can't be, does the Constitution prohibit, or more precisely, fail affirmatively to authorize delegation of legislative power? The question is, how would one recognize a delegation of legislative power and distinguish it from ordinary legislation in which there is necessarily going to be some room for interpretation both by executives and courts? And back in 1825, when John Marshall first took on this question, still today, I think by far the most sophisticated treatment of the issue uh, by, uh, by any uh, Supreme Court opinion, he said, the line has not been exactly drawn, which separates those important subjects, which must be entirely regulated by the legislature itself, from those of less interest, in which a general provision may be made. Uh, more important, of less interest. You actually analyze it, what that sounds like is Congress has to make those decisions that are important enough so that Congress has to make them, you know. Okay. Uh, hasn't proven very satisfactory. So for two centuries, there have been attempts by various scholars and judges to try to come up with a formulation that beats it. Uh, they've tried to come up with things that represent an expression of political commitment to uh, all sorts of stuff. Bottom line, I think Marshall had it exactly right. Uh, that is what I wrote uh, 20 years ago in an article, and I stand by it today. Uh, I think that's exactly the right analysis. Uh, some things are fundamental, and some things are ancillary. And if it's ancillary, it can be the subject of interpretation. If it's fundamental, it can't. And there's simply no way, I don't think, to escape from that. This is why... My old boss, Justice Scalia, runs from it as the vampire flees garlic. Because there is no way to apply that kind of norm without exercising a substantial degree of judgment. My point is, number one, well, yes, but that is in fact the task that the Constitution sets for you. You don't want to do it, take the pension. Uh, and uh, secondly, even if there are a lot of hard borderline cases, there are going to be a whole heaping lot of easy ones, easy kills, as I say. So that's sort of argument number one against uh, authorizations of delegation. The second, apologies to Billy Joel, um, is, is in some ways more profound. Um, 
25 years ago, I remember a, a legal scholar who later became a federal judge and has now gone back to the academy saying interpretation is like architecture, form follows function. And I, I thought at the time, you know, that it's interesting, but it's not exactly quite right. It's, it's not so much why you're interpreting that affects what you're doing, but, but what you're interpreting. If you're interpreting a poem, you're going to be looking for simile, metaphor, onomatopoeia, things like that. My wife hands me a shopping list and I start looking for simile and metaphor. Very bad things are going to happen. So in order to interpret the Constitution, you have to know what it is that you're interpreting. And for two centuries, people have tried to answer what the Constitution is. They've called it a super statute, a compact, a treaty, a corporate charter, a chain novel, a principal symbol of the aspirations of the tradition, and my two all-time favorites, that set of beliefs or whatever that has some hold on our behavior. And the winner, the, the still reigning champion, Peggy Raiden, a reflection of the tension between our understanding of our present state and our understanding of social ideals towards which progress is possible. That is her definition of the Constitution, by the way. Um, okay. Um, no. That fella down there at the bottom was a very famous man, James Iredell. He was one of the early Supreme Court justices. He was also a prominent Federalist at the North Carolina Ratifying Convention. And in the course of that convention, he said, the Constitution may be considered as a great power of attorney. Uh, that is an authorization from a uh, private law matter. People may, some of you may actually have executed powers of attorney. Give some measure of control over your affairs to others. Now, I suspect that Iredell meant that as a rhetorical flourish. Um, my co-author, Rob Nadelson, to whom all of the credit for this is due, I think has proven as conclusively as one can prove anything in this business that that is exactly right, that that is exactly the right characterization of the Constitution. It follows all of the forms, styles, structures of 18th century private law fiduciary instruments. And the reason that's important is because fiduciary instruments, guardianships, powers of attorney, uh, authorizations to executors, to factors who are going to go overseas and or serve as your agents, were subject to a very, very thick, long-established set of background rules for interpretation. And one of the most important Fundamental of those background rules for trust instruments was unless the instrument specifically authorizes it, you can't delegate a fiduciary or trust authority. And since we don't have the Numenal Constitution, there is no affirmative delegate, uh, authorization for delegation. So viewing the Constitution as a trust instrument, that's an obvious source of a non-delegation principle. All right, well, all of that is confirmed by our friend John Locke. Once you understand it in fiduciary, or as we say, agency terms, what Locke said makes perfectly good sense. The power of the legislative being derived by a positive voluntary grant can be no other than what the positive grant conveyed, being only to make laws and not to make legislators. That is a straightforward, easy application of pre-18th century agency fiduciary law. Now, final question. I know um, the timing is, 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 is not good here. Uh, I, we're not coming up on 515, uh, but we are coming up on 215. Uh, that's 515 from the who. It's from Quadrophenia. Um, why should I care? What, what, so what? I mean, all of this tells you is that if you actually read the 18th century constitution, it tells you legislators shouldn't be delegating legislative power. Um, why is that interesting? Well, that raises a whole question, which would be the subject not just of another talk, but another series of talks, about whether it makes sense from a normative perspective to care what the Constitution of the 18th century says. All I've said so far, I, I've read it. I could just as well do an analysis of the Constitution of Ghana or the Constitution of the Confederacy, and I could come up with, using the same techniques, interpretations and analyses about the extent to which they permit or exclude delegations. Does that say anything interesting about the way people ought to behave? Well, 
exempt. That's a, a different topic, why one ought to care about the Constitution. I do want to say something, that would be this question, about um, if, if you were drafting a Constitution, would you draft it with prohibitions on delegation? Uh, and that turns out to be an interesting question. There, there are quite sophisticated arguments in political science for why it is that presidents and presidential delegates might actually make better lawmakers than Congress. After all, if you're talking about granting power back to Congress, you know, really, that's, that's, that's what you get. Uh, on the other hand, Lois Lerner, Eric Holder, uh, we may have contempt for Congress. They're both in contempt of Congress. Is there some systematic, principled reason for preferring one institution over another as a general matter? Uh, and, and the answer is, I think there is, and it comes down to that great legal scholar, uh, Clint Eastwood. Um, how risk averse are you? It's actually easy to imagine circumstances in which presidents are likely to produce, from an objective standpoint, better laws than Congress. But, go back to my point about unbundling 535 versus 1 to 7, they're also going to produce a whole lot more of them. Right? The trade-off is, if you don't follow the elaborate procedures for lawmaking specified in the Constitution, you're going to get a lot more laws. Now, if you happen to think that the vast majority of those laws are going to be really good laws, there may be an argument for saying, well, let's put it in the hands of the body that's going to make more of the really good laws. If you kind of suspect, you know, a lot of them are going to suck. And that was certainly James Madison's perspective on things. He was not anticipating really good results from the folks in whom this power of trust and fiduciary duty were being reposed. Uh, the risk-averse strategy, if you will, uh, is, to, uh, is, to, is to keep the process as complicated, messy. You're going to get some, some, some wrong results, but in the long run, I do think, as, as uh, I think the uh, little blurb about me said, um, next to a well-armed citizenry, dividing powers among various governmental institutions to make sure that it stays separated has proven empirically, I think, to be uh, one of the best defenses of liberty. And with that, I think uh, I've managed to leave about 10 minutes for questions. I was hoping to leave 15, but I think we started late, so it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Uh, yeah. I should say, by the way, if, if you actually pick up a copy of the outline, there's like three pages of detailed stuff on a totally separate question, which is why, when interpreting the federal constitution, it makes sense to look for the original meaning. There's actually an objectivist philosopher at Texas, Tara Smith, who has argued vigorously against that. I'm going to write an article debating her on that point sometime in the next couple of years, but it hasn't been written yet. But my, my outline of that argument is, 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 is there. To, to get us started, Gary. Um, I remember back, I think it was in, in the 80s when Reagan was in office and yeah. they were trying to deregulate um, a, a number of, of things. And they kept getting court challenges from, the, from liberals and people on the left claiming that the, um, the regulatory agencies had put in place a whole you know, certain regulations, and now they yeah. wanted to take them out. Yeah. And uh, suits were brought in the, in the uh, courts that this was arbitrary and capricious yes. uh, administrative law. Is there some asymmetry that <clears throat> makes it harder to get rid of a regulation than, than it is to put one in in the first place? Yeah, no, it's a great question. There's actually a Supreme Court case specifically on that point. This is a non-constitutional issue, by the way. None of those challenges involved. Everyone assumed that the agencies had constitutional power. Once an agency goes through this non-lawmaking process, right, you can challenge the result of the agency rulemaking in court. The substantive change, you can argue that they exceeded the authority granted by the statute, which in the case of a statute that says nothing will never happen, right? So in those contexts where there's no content to the statute, what 
what the courts have come up with, and this is really an invention of the last 50 years, is the idea that the agency has to explain in a publicly available fashion why it reached the conclusions that it did. Now, they don't have to be particularly good reasons. They have to be, as they say, not arbitrary or capricious, not really stupid reasons. But the agency essentially has an essay requirement. When it promulgates these laws, this is what it is. When they promulgate these little regulations that function as, as, as statutes, they have to write an essay explaining why it is that they did it, what they think they're hoping to accomplish, what things they consider. All right, and that's true whether they are promulgating a new regulation or whether they are repealing an old regulation. Because from the standpoint of the way that the law of judicial review is set up, there's no difference between those two things there was actually a serious argument made in the early 1980s suggesting that it ought to be easier to repeal a regulation than to enact a new one. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1983 specifically rejected that. They didn't impose a stricter requirement for repealing regulations than for enacting new ones, but they wouldn't lower the standard to make it easier to go one way rather than the other. And for whatever it's worth, from within the technical doctrines of administrative law, forgetting a, that's probably the right answer, at least the one that coheres best with the overall uh, 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 statutory doctrine of administrative law. But none of that was constituted. No, nobody was raising constitutional challenges to any of those things. I mean, there, there is a limited way in which sometimes changes in regulations can be argued to be a taking of property without just compensation. There's not a lot of hard law on that. There's some scholarship on when that might be the case, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of hard law on it. So I have a, sort of a side, Dale Hong. I have a sort of a side question, um, and it has to do with the fact that uh, we create all these administrative rules, and they say oh, by the way, you're subject to them, and these are civil rules, and therefore the Bill of Rights doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. And I have tried to find um, good papers point. on this. Point. There's not that I could find a single good paper that came out of the U.S. There are some common law countries that have talked about what these can be, and short of the death penalty, anything can be done to you under civil rules, which therefore you don't have your Bill of Rights. Do you know of any good papers? Yeah, you there's, there, no, it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely great topic. I actually used to teach that very, I used to teach a seminar in advanced administrative law, and that was one of the topics that I regularly covered. For, for those who are, who are missing this, the Constitution sharply distinguishes in a whole variety of ways between when the government is coming after you criminally and when it's coming after you civilly. Now, in terms of consequences, if it's a civil case, they can't put you in prison, right? If it's a criminal case, they, they can. And when, that's, when it's a criminal, you get a right to a jury trial, right to confront witnesses against you, right to compulsory presentation of witnesses, indictment by grand jury, and not specifically enumerated in the Constitution, but implicit in it, government has to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. On the other hand, if it's a civil case, let's say you've breached a contract with the government and they want to collect 10,000 bucks from you, the standard of proof is preponderance of the evidence, a whole lot less than if it's a criminal case. And all of those glorious jury trial, the, 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 the right to counsel, cross-examine, confrontation, all the rest of that, none of that applies in civil contexts. Now, you're an administrative agency or you're Congress uh, enacting a statute authorizing an administrative agency. How, is, how are the administrative regulations going to be enforced? Well, one thing you could do is prescribe, as Congress, uh, criminal penalties for violation of regulatory norms, in which case people would have to be given all of these constitutional protections every time. Suppose instead what you prescribe is a fine of $10 million a day. And I'm not making those numbers up. Some of the environmental regulations can, in fact, result in fines amounting to millions of dollars per day. Uh, is that a criminal proceeding or a civil proceeding? It's a fine. They're not trying to put you in prison, right? Well, the government contends and has successfully made this argument repeatedly. It's just a civil action. I mean, no one's going to prison, so you don't get all of these constitutional protections and no proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the situation that was, that was being talked about. There are a couple of 
openings in the law that allow people in some circumstances to argue that a particularly oppressive fine, even though Congress labels it civil, it's really criminal. By and large, those arguments do not succeed. Now, as so to whether there's anyone who's written on that, um, yeah, um, Philip Hamburger, who's a legal historian at Columbia Law School, has just published a book called Is Administrative Law Unlawful? Uh, it is a phenomenal work. Um, I'm actually one of the dust jacket commenters on it, so it's, it's really a terrific work. And what he does is, tra he's, an, he's a legal historian, he's not an administrative law person, he's not a constitutional scholar, he's a legal historian. And he looks mostly at you know, England in the 1500s and 1600s and 1700s, debates over the royal prerogative. And he looks at modern America and he says, it's exactly the same things that people were screaming about in England in the 16th and 17th centuries. And they're like decapitating kings over this sort of thing. I mean, it's all exactly the same stuff. And he does a beautiful job of showing the parallels between all of those early debates over the royal prerogative in England and what happens in modern administration. And he has a specific discussion of the role of jury trial and specifically how classifying some of these actions as civil rather than criminal undermines some of those fundamental principles of law. Um, so the reason why you may not have seen it is it just came out, I mean literally months ago. Uh, is administrative law unlawful? There's one article in, I think, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review in the 1970s that said something. It wasn't all that great. But other than that, that's why you missed it, because there wasn't any. But no longer true. No, it's just that some of them should be. When you're trying to, when the government is trying to enforce its regulatory norms, yes. If they're trying to enforce a contract when the government is behaving as a market actor, if you will, perfectly sensible for them to proceed through the civil system. What he's objecting to is the government in its enforcement capacity trying to present that as a civil action simply because they aren't trying to put you in prison. That's the, that's the line that he draws between enforcement actions and simply enforcing its authority as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a standard market actor. If you can't pay the fine, can't they put you in jail for that? No. Actually, just, just like if you are, are held liable for breach of contract for $100,000 and you don't have it, all the creditor can do is find whatever property you have and have it sold at judicial auction and the proceeds used to pay the debt. Uh, you, you can't go to prison for non-payment of a debt. And that's true when the government is the creditor as well. They can seize all of your assets, they can sell all of your assets at a judicial auction, uh, but you don't go to prison for it. Yes? Okay. This may just be my misunderstanding, but I was reading recently that in Texas, uh, when people are fined for various offenses and they can't pay their fines, they, are, they end up in prison. And they're often offered the choice. You want to go to prison or you want to pay this money? Oh, Which, that's fine. I mean, as, as, if you are genuinely prosecuted in a criminal fashion with all of the procedural protections that are part of a criminal process, it is well established that a fine rather than a prison sentence is a perfectly permissible sentence if the statutes permit it. That is, you can have criminal offenses with all of the constitutional bells and whistles where the end result is you pay a fine instead of going to prison. That's the possibility that makes the, the gimmick of switching it between civil and criminal possible. So it's certainly within the compass of the law, again, assuming that the statutes permit it, to have a sentence that says, you know, 30 days in prison or a $500 fine in the alternative. But all of that is predicated on their first being a proper criminal proceeding. They couldn't do it as a civil proceeding without all the constitutional protections, without proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, just because the fine is a possibility. Yeah, it, that could be. I mean, I, I've never heard of traffic violations of a minor sort carrying possible prison sentences, but it doesn't mean a state legislature couldn't do it. I mean, drunk driving, for example, is a traffic regulation, and uh, it, it certainly could carry a prison sentence as a possible, uh, as a possible violation. 
but again, would have to go through all of the machinery of the criminal justice system to get a, to get a conviction, not just the, it's much easier to establish civil liability than criminal liability. That's the bottom line. Okay, thank you, Gary. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you.